Thanks. Sorry, I had a little problem with the Zoom. Yeah, no problem. All right, I'm going to, uh, uh, quorum being president, I'm calling to order a, a meeting of the Belmont Municipal Light Board. And uh, we've got a lot of uh, uh, items on the agenda today, so I think we should dive right in. Uh, first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. Uh, don't want to take a lot of time on this, but if we're okay with those minutes, uh, are there any comments on those minutes? I have none. They're well prepared. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was really, uh, really good job. Uh, do I hear a motion for the approval of the minutes dated April 26, 2022, both in a regular and the executive session? So moved. Need a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, I guess we need a roll call on this. I'm not sure. Anyway, yes. Travis? Yeah. Uh, Travis Frank, aye. Andy? Andy Machado, aye. David? Dave Evers, aye. Michael? Michael McCray, aye. Steve Klyonski, myself, aye. Those minutes are approved. Okay, great. Uh, let's move on to the Steve, uh, Steve. I have a quick question. I know I can, this was a late agenda item, but is there if there's an opportunity to discuss the Energy Committee um, appointment, or uh, I would like to make sure that that I, I notice it's not on the agenda, so I just wanted to lay that out up front. Uh, that, that was what you had uh, mentioned to me. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood. I thought you <laughs> wanted to put it on for the, uh, the the next meeting, but we can. Oh, okay. Well. I Anyway, if we have time, I would love, I think it would be more timely um, given the roll off of, of meetings. But anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, let's get it in a little bit later then. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I added pencils in on mine as well. So. Okay. okay. Great. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. So I guess we're uh, caught to the cost of service presentation. All right, I will, uh, I guess I'll just introduce uh, Mayhew Seavey, who's with us this morning. He's with uh, PLM, and uh, as you all should know, he's doing our cost of service study. So uh, with that, I'll let him take it and, and uh, start the presentation. Great. If uh, somebody could uh, uh, allow me to uh, share the, okay. the you, screen, you have, I will. You have shareability. Okay, I do. You're right. Okay, uh, because not everybody here may be fully conversant with all the concepts of cost of service study and rate design, I've started out at a fairly high level uh, to sort of give us a background so we all have uh, a common language and vocabulary and understanding of what the issues are. Uh, apologize for the date there. I originally had this in my calendar for yesterday, but uh, they'll soldier through. Uh, I'm going to, I've uh, broken this into two parts. I'm going to talk about the basic principles of cost of service and rate design, and then I'm going to give you the results of the 2021 historic test year cost of service uh, analysis. It's, it is quite a lot to squeeze in here, so I'll try to be as, as concise as possible. Uh, I'm going to talk about the objectives of rate design. I'm going to talk about cost allocation, and then I'm going to talk about the, the actual process of designing rates. Uh, the objectives of rate design uh, are uh, adequacy, fairness, competitiveness, stability, and clarity. Uh, adequacy means that the rate and, uh, and other revenues should cover the utilities operating expenses and fund the renewal and expansion of the plant in order to continue to provide reliable service and the measure of adequacy is that you have net income and overall rate of return within your statutory Massachusetts general laws chapter 164 guidelines of between zero and eight percent you're not allowed to sell electricity at a loss so you have to make at least break even and you're not allowed to earn more than eight uh, percent on the value of the plant fairness is uh, dictates that the rate paid by, a, by each type or class of customer should reflect as accurately as possible the cost of providing service to that class of customer. 
And the measure of that is the individual customer class rate of return. We also like to look at competitiveness. The cost of energy to each customer should be competitive with the cost of energy paid by comparable customers to other energy providers in the immediate vicinity or benchmark. Uh, and we look at uh, typical bill comparisons when we look at this. Uh, we aim to have stability as well. You want the average cost of energy paid by any customer not to fluctuate excessively from month to month or year to year. Uh, and so we try to minimize the fluctuations caused by changes in power cost adjustments. Uh, oops, oops, somebody has some other utility snuck in there. Uh, some utilities use seasonal rates uh, and, uh, and, and, and that needs to be looked at. Uh, sometimes there's a cost basis for doing that. Uh, and finally, you want clarity. You would like the, the rate and its individual components to be easily understood by the customer. And the customer should be able to verify the amount of the bill with a minimum of effort. And uh, this is basically, you know, when you see it, if you've seen an Eversource bill, you know that that's not clear. Uh, I think Belmont Light does a pretty good job of having, uh, having its bills be uh, clear. So those are the objectives that we start out with. Uh, you may have others as a board uh, have, have your own objectives that also get fed in there. Now, cost allocation is the process of, of assigning the utility's revenue requirements to each customer class. And we allocate both plant and expenses uh, on the basis of three general factors, uh, customers, demand, and energy. Customer costs are allocated, uh, uh, customer costs are costs that are related to the number of customers rather than the amount of energy that, that's consumed. So your metering and billing expenses, your customer accounts expenses, uh, the particular plant that's dedicated to an, an individual customer rather than uh, a group of customers. Demand allocation, and we, we divide demand-related expenses into distribution and purchase power because they have different causation, but uh, demand-related costs are costs that are related to the maximum rate at which the customer is using energy uh, because re regardless of the time of use because uh, that's what determines the size of the facilities that you need to have in place in order to serve the customer. So the examples of demand related uh, costs are transformers, lines, all that, all of, basically all of your infrastructure is uh, demand related. Uh, there are also capacity and transmission uh, demand allocations. Uh, and that's related to the what each individual customer class is contributing to the system demand during the monthly or annual uh, billing period because that's how your transmission and, and forward capacity bill, billing costs are assigned to you. So uh, we try to allocate those directly onto the customer to the extent that we can. Uh, energy allocation factors is, is basically uh, the number of kilowatt hours and really the only thing that it is allocated on the basis of energy is, is your purchased energy uh, charge from contracts or from the ISO New England spot market. Uh, and finally, we'll go through the uh, rate design process. Uh, I like to, I break. cost of service study, uh, a financial projection, and then finally the rate design. The historic test year cost of service study takes a full year's historic data, uh, allocates the costs to each rate class, and then compares the revenues from each class to the allocated costs to determine the rate of return for individual customer classes and also overall. 
a financial projection then basically builds off of that cost of service to do a five-year projection of revenues and expenses, allocating the expenses. And this model will then forecast the overall rates of return, the class rates of return, uh, operating cash balances, and the adequacy of your revenues to fund any needed capital program. And then from that, we then develop a strategy for uh, meeting the revenue requirements over a five-year horizon. Uh, this gives you the ability to decide whether you want to phase in any needed rate increases. Uh, you can also make decisions about funding capital additions be with, with debt rather than uh, with uh, depreciation funds. So it's a useful model. We, we look at cash reserves and we consider several factors uh, when we look at, uh, at, at uh, proper levels for cash reserves, what your exposure is to purchase power, cost volatility, any planned capital expenditures, any actuarial liabilities you have for pension uh, liabilities, OPEB liabilities, any debt service requirements. And we also look at uh, you know, levels of your O&M uh, and you know, have enough cash reserves for a typical 45 to 90 days uh, coverage on that. Uh, then we develop individual rate designs to, we wanna produce uh, adequate revenue to cover operating expenses plus funding capital improvements and making your payment in lieu of taxes. And at the same time, we wanna be sure that we're sending uh, clear and correct price signals to the customer so that they can make decisions about uh, their energy usage and, and investment in, uh, in new plant that they're going to make, uh, whether it's a residential customer considering uh, elect uh, electrification or uh, all those investments that people make. When, you're, when we're designing rates, we have, we're once again balancing objectives. We, you, you wanna to move towards uniform rates of return for all customers. You would like all the rates to be equally competitive. I, I find given that, that the investor owned utilities have pretty much seeded the field here to the municipals, that uh, competitiveness is less of a concern than it used to be, uh, but uh, we still like to look at it and finally, you want to you want to, you want to minimize the ch differences in the change, increase or decrease between customer classes. Mayhew, uh, when, you, Mayhew when you say competitive, you mean equalized? Uh, well, it doesn't need to be equalized, but you would like you know you don't want your rates to be fifty percent lower th than EverSource for residential and ten percent lower for commercial. Uh, you're you're getting. Uh, you know, the, I find that the investor-owned, because they're because they're regulated and because they have more scrutiny than municipal utility rates, uh, tend to be a good benchmark in terms of of that. Although, as you know, the regulatory process isn't always uh, completely impartial. Sometimes it can get skewed by uh, litigation. But uh, yeah, I, I would like to. And these days, I tend to look more at other municipal utilities and, and, and also sort of where the particular municipal stands in comparison to the other municipal utilities in the area or, or in the state. And there's various ways of measuring that. And would you say that we should, you would, you said the 50% lower and 10% lower for the residential business. Um, but even if that, would you recommend balancing that out even if that's where the costs were allocated well no that's that, that's right that's why there are three sets of uh, objectives here and you have to you do have to balance them out against each other uh you're not going to totally skew your own rates of return in order to be more competitive so it's it's basically it's a triangle and you get you're getting pulled from from different in, in different directions and 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 that's where the really where the the Light Commission comes in is, is making that making those policy decisions. I give you the information and, and, and then you decide. So in other words, each objective produces a different rate design. 
which has a different impact on each customer class. And we, we look at those and make some decisions about how to move forward. So now we have the results of the actual 20, 2021 historic test year cost of service study uh, for Belmont Light. Uh, I pulled together billing determinants from your actual billing data for 2021 uh, with the availability of the data fire hose that, uh, that, that your MDM provides. Uh, this was uh, it, it really a pleasure. I always enjoy having more data than less. And, and I was able to develop a really clear picture of usage, particularly the all important, uh, what's each class's contribution to your monthly and annual billing peaks. And, and also how does that, how does the load shape uh, price out in terms of energy market prices? So uh, I did, because, because there's, there are, you, you maintain this for a fairly large number of uh, different groupings. We aggregated some of it for ease of modeling, uh, but, uh, but it's actually quite detailed. Uh, we then multiply the billing units by the individual rate components to calculate uh, rate revenues. And uh, I like to benchmark those calculated revenues against the revenues that you report uh, to the DPU. And uh, this particular case, the calculated revenues were within three hundredths of a percent of the reported revenues, which is extraordinary. However, there was more variation among the classes, so it's it, it's it's not uniformly perfect, but uh, I, I think we've got a very good model here that's correctly modeling the revenues that the rates are producing, which then gives you comfort when you design new rates that the revenues that you're predicting new rates will produce uh, will actually materialize when you put the rates into effect, which is really one of the main points of doing this historic test here is to verify the modeling uh, and make sure that it's uh, that you're going to be able to predict uh, what happens with a set of new rates. And then adjust the rate revenues to reflect other operating revenues and other uh, income. Uh, and in this case, there's about $800,000 in other operating revenues and income. And that represents about a third of your net income, uh, uh, which is, is not unusual for municipal light departments. I've seen other cases where virtually all of their net income is coming from sources other than rate revenues. Uh, they're being very creative in terms of generating revenue. Uh, and then we just generate uh, or al allocate that other revenues on the basis of rate revenue because you have to do something. Can I ask you a quick question on that? Um, and I, I don't necessarily want to slow us down now, but if it would be interesting to hear or see a list of what you just mentioned there with other MLPs being creative or clever in, in terms of revenue generation and how that impacts the actual overall costs that they bill customers at. Going back to your competitive comment, I know that there are some MLPs in Massachusetts, at least with overall residential rates closer to 10 cents all in. Um, and so let's not belabor and, and dive down that rabbit hole, but it might be an interesting thing to, to follow up on at, uh, at a later date. Okay, yeah, I've noted that, that's a good question. So uh, we developed these allocation factors from your actual meter, meter data from the FDM system. We recognize three general categories of allocation factors, demand allocators that are used to allocate most of your distribution expenses purchase capacity and transmission. And that's about 45% of your total expenses. Uh, customer allocation based is essentially on the number of customers. And that's about 15% of expenses. And finally, energy related uh, fuel and purchase power. Uh, and that's about 40% of your expenses. And we do try to reflect the, the, the fact that energy has a time varying cost. And so we adjust the allocation of energy costs uh, to reflect that. Uh, operating maintenance expenses are allocated using the allocation factors. Uh, and we also then take the direct allocation of costs and use that to create a new allocation factor 
call what we call the O&M allocation factor that we use to allocate general and administrative expenses. Um, plant, we do the same thing with plants. We allocate uh, <coughs> plant on the basis of the uh, of customer and, and uh, demand allocation largely. And um, we are, so we get, what, we're this, what this brings us to is the, uh, the bottom line here, the rate of return, both overall and by customer class. So the overall rate of return for 2021, I calculated to be 4.1%, pretty much at the midpoint between zero and 8%. Uh, the, 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 the uh, allowed range and individual class rates of return vary from minus 15.6% for residential low income, which I mean, that's not surprising. It's a subsidized rate and a high of 20.7% for commercial um, is well within the normal range for municipal electric utility rates. Uh, I, I, I do rate studies for 20 or so of the municipal utilities in Massachusetts and, and uh, you know, you're, you're towards the low end of the variation. Although I have to say, munis have been good at moving their rates more closer to uniform rates of return in recent uh, years. The commercial demand class has a higher rate of return than the non-demand class. And that's a, a little bit different from what we usually see. Uh, there's some there's some uh, detail that we can uh, dig into there. I think as to what's changed since the last time uh, I did a rate study for Belmont, and then I've begun working on that. Uh, the rates of return for the municipal classes are low, but it's still higher than usual in municipal utility rate making. What I what I typically see uh, is that. Uh, Municipalities that have a dedicated municipal rate class typically design that around a zero rate of return, uh, essentially selling electricity to the town at cost. Uh, so uh, you might want to take a look at that. It's if it, it, on the other hand, if they don't, they'll typically take any net income that's earned on that and and and, and report that as a benefit to the uh, municipality. Excuse me, Mayhew. Uh, I, I know we don't. I know we've only got about uh, ten more minutes on this, which is uh, it's going to be a, a struggle to get through it all. But I just wanted to ask you uh, for the uh, re residential low income, uh, where does that sub subsidy get spread to? Uh, that's going to be spread uniformly across all customers, uh, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty close to the end of this, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, this is the, this is the, in graphical form and in tabular form, the, you can see the allocated revenues, allocated expenses, uh, net income, uh, allocated plant, and then the rate of return. Uh, uh, well, so, can I just ask also quickly, you mentioned a 20.7% rate of return for commercial class on the prior, on the prior slide. Yes, okay. Uh, where that, where, where that, does that show up on this slide? Uh, that may have been before I made the last round of adjustments to the model. It should be, it, it should be 19.7. Uh, okay. And, and, and actually, this, the, the, the next slide becomes even more interesting because built into this is some net income from purchase power costs that, uh, that, that uh, really should, shouldn't be there, should get netted out in a, in a future rate design. So the, the actual uh, rates of return on distribution rates alone uh, are, is more uniform than this. Uh, oh, good. So, uh, and this is where it gets a little bit dense, uh, but I, I, I've broken out the cost of service into uh, distribution rates and purchase power rates and looked at uh, how those are performing. All of your net income should be 
being produced by distribution rates. You shouldn't be making any money on purchase power charges uh, because those should just be a, a pass through of costs. Uh, and it looks like uh, in 2021 that the, the the various energy generation and transmission rates under collected about 840,000. And if if we normalize those uh, to to actual, then the rate of return from the distribution rates alone would have been 5.6 percent, and the rates of return. Uh, while, while there's a small variation, you can see that the, the rate of return from energy generation and transmission charges varies between about minus one and a half percent to plus three uh, percent because those classes are contributing differently to costs, the, the cost of uh, capacity. And yeah, I'm sorry, uh, my confusion. Generation here, does that mean capacity? What does that? Uh... Uh, in, in this context, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I, I don't recall off the top of my head what's being collected through the generation charge. I think, uh, let's go back and well, if you can. I don't wanna hold you up, we could, we could go back to Mayhew, I have a, do you, if you need to get that thought, Steve's question out of your head. <laughs> you can, but if not, if not, then I'll, I'll keep going. So I have a question around um, the the idea that those are pass through costs. Is that? And I I have a hypothesis. You correct me. Is it because those are supposed to be pass through costs to the customers in the rate design because the return on investment is based on the value of the plant, which is That's part correct. of just which is part of distribution. Yeah, if you own a okay. generation plant, if you own a power plant, then then you would be earning a rate of return on that as well. But uh, the way the way we typically design uh, purchase power rates is as a pass through uh, because you don't you don't have any plant. You know, you're a, you're essentially running a a, a a classic distribution business. You're buying at wholesale and selling at retail, and 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 you're your operating costs are, are what you, your facility investment is what you earn your rate of return on. Can I ask a question on that just to pull a little bit harder? Thinking through part of the goals being that we want to have, <clears throat> excuse me, stability for rate classes and customer payments year over year. That is in part enabled by having a small reserve fund that you can kind of float up and float down in terms of what you're at. Thinking of those as pure pass-throughs, recognizing the difficult situation we're in today with higher energy costs, I, I, I guess I want to just subtly push back philosophically that they should be a pure pass-through as opposed to something that you can have over a five-year budget cycle, um, essentially looking to pad up or recover down from the costs of those so as to maintain a healthy reserve fund. I, I agree right. with you in principle that you know we have capital invested in the the distribution system. We're not a generation or transmission system operator owner, but I and, and it's maybe small percentages. But just as we sort of think through this, I guess just sort of sharing my thought, those maybe could be viewed as less exactly on target to be a pure pass through as opposed to woven into the five year budget cycle where we're trying to be able to provide stability over those longer term periods recognizing big power fluctuations yeah absolutely uh the, the not to get too philosophical or accounting uh but you 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 want those to be a pass through over time but not necessarily in any given accounting cycle uh, right. although yeah, no, we're on the exact you, same page now. you're, yep. you're going to carry you're going to carry an adjustment forward so you, it, it ought to at the end of the year on your books if you've done if you've done the accounting right it should it, it should even out you, if you under collected you should carry that forward as a as an as a, an adjusting entry um, and so the rates of return from the distribution rates alone leaving out the power supply and other revenues are actually fluctuate between one point four percent for residential and fourteen and a half. For commercial demand, that's uh, that, that's pretty uh, uh, for for municipal utility. That's pretty uh, a narrow spread, uh, and and you're not losing money on any 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 anything except uh, the, the 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 rate that you're consciously subsidizing. 
So, so, so Mayhew, excuse me. So the when you say commercial demand, that's the elements of the three rate classes that have in part demand charges. Right. Yeah. Each, so the the the, the uh, commercial. Let's see. Yeah. Rate B uh, is uh, is divided into. Uh, Customers, smaller customers that that are, aren't getting a demand charge, and larger customers that are paying a demand charge. So the, those are the the two. They're both rate B, but one of them is B with demand, and the other is B without demand. And the same thing is true on the municipal. Uh, yeah. And 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 there's it, actually the the fluctuation be between those is is large and 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 hard to account for and also goes in the opposite direction from what you would expect you normally see a large customer contributing a smaller rate of return and i think what's going on there is that there's been a shift in in costs between when the rates were designed uh and and, and today in, in the relative amount of costs and also the, the the timing of when those costs are occurred. So we just need to adjust the rates to reflect uh, what the conditions are now. Yeah, it's my expectation that that hasn't been changed in probably decades. Right. Um, yeah, I, I went back and I'm, I'm doing a comparison uh, with the 2011 cost of service study. And, and it's bearing that out that there have been significant shifts in in the, the time of day when the peak occurs. Uh, also, another thing that we're seeing here is the availability of, of actual Belmont specific uh, uh, load data. In the past, we've always used uh, 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 investor owned utility uh, meter data because, the, because it, was, it was publicly available. And, and, and that's, you know, it, it broadly corresponds to Belmont's usage patterns with with uh, residential customers, with small commercial customers, because those are fairly homogeneous classes. When you get to the larger classes where you have fewer and larger customers, the differences between the investor-owned utility data and Belmont data gets accentuated. So that may be another effect that we're seeing here is just the availability of better data here gives us a, a better picture of how your actual customers are using electricity and, and causing uh, costs. So these are the rates of return here uh, on uh, from just distribution rates. And you can see it's, it's like uh, they're, they're closer here between the, uh, unfortunately the headings aren't here, so you don't know which ones you're looking at. Uh, oh, that was careless. Uh, but it's, uh, Small commercial without demand is 11%. Commercial with demand is 14.5%. That's going to be a relatively minor adjustment. Uh, electric heating, 10%. This is the, uh, the, the uh, I believe, the power, 13.8. Uh, so that's a little bit on the high side. And, and then these, th the three municipal classes are all in single digits uh, and, and would more typically be uh, closer to zero. That's not a lot of revenue if you look at the net income to give those uh, that that revenue up. You can make it up somewhere else, but it, we'll get to that when we look at. Uh, can I say a quick clarifying question? What is category E power? What does that represent for Belmont Light? Those are your largest customers, uh, other than the, the large municipal customers. Uh, there's uh, was there about 40 customers in that class? I think. It's, it's what we report as industrial on our financial statements. Industrial, gotcha. yeah. So uh, the, the last thing I think, I think this is the last thing we're going to talk about, yeah, uh, is the what I call a flat rate design. And, and this is where we take, uh, we look at what the rate components ought to be if we just follow the cost of service. Uh, down to individual components. In other words, so if I take all of the uh, allocated uh, customer-related expenses for the residential class and divide that by the number of residential bills, 
that says it's cost me twenty dollars and fourteen cents to send out a, a, a residential bill, and and I'm collecting ten dollars and sixty cents on that. So that's uh, that's an indication that those the that that bill is not recovering the whole cost. You do you you do end up recovering that, of course, through the distribution rate because if you look at the distribution rate, it's actually quite a bit higher than the cost of service based distribution rate. So you, you're recovering some customer charges through a residential kilowatt hour charge. Uh, we, can, uh, we can talk about the implications of that uh, when, when, you, when we talk about adjusting that, if you, want to, if you want to phase in an increase to the customer charge, it has a differential impact on customers depending on, on how many kilowatt hours they're using. Uh, a customer who uses very few kilowatt hours would see a, a pretty steep increase in their bill if you doubled the customer charge. Uh, these others, uh, transmission and generation, are, are actually fairly close to the cost, and those changes probably just reflect changes in actual costs. Uh, we know that transmission costs have increased very, very greatly over the last 10 years. Uh, while a lot of generation costs, energy uh, and, and capacity on, on, on a net haven't increased a lot in the last 10 years. So, and uh, the actual uh, is, and this by, by, by cost base reflects uh, a 4% rate of return. So, we can do this breakdown for all of the other classes. I have that uh, all that uh, information somewhere else, but we'll take a look at this when we actually look at rate design and what the implications of changing those uh, costs are. So the next step, next step is to build a, again and build a five-year financial forecast model for the years 2023 to 2027. Uh, we'll use the 21 cost of service model. And, 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 a, and a 2022 budget and the capital budget to project uh, revenues and expenses and plan out over five years. That will then determine if the current rates will produce adequate revenues. And then we work uh, looking to make any changes in rate design to meet whatever objectives you have. And that's the end of my, my prepared remarks, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Travis? Um, I've got a handful, uh, but I think I'll just focus with the most. Uh, so you mentioned at the top of the slide deck that there was kind of this uh, you know, notion of all the great costs, et cetera, et cetera, capacity transmission generation, and plus uh, you know capital expenses that are foreseeable in the five years. And I'm curious, I guess and maybe this is a question for Craig or, or what you've included. But what uh, what are you thinking there um, around the capital expenses and over the five year period, um, Craig? I guess maybe like what what types of ex other than the actual costs and, and so what we have coming up on the horizon for projects is, is that what you're kind of yeah and in, in particular I'm wondering you know if we think that we want to do some other investments such as like the solar. Or something like, can we build in? So, can we build into some sort of additional finance? You know, like pre start building up some money to help for a project, whether it's storage or whether it's solar or whether it's some of the other initiatives that we have, and whether those are have, are included in the five year model or will be. So, right now, um, we're in a, a little bit of a different situation because we have a a uh, construction fund from the uh, substation project that we're still drawing off of. Uh, however, that's not 100% um, going to cover our costs of converting our entire system. So we are, in fact, doing what you what you just said, but we're putting money into that construction fund to continue the conversion, the voltage conversion project. So um, we can take a closer look at, you know, setting up other funds, if you will, for other types of projects such as uh, solar or uh, you know battery storage, things of that nature. Um, but right now, if we had everything aside, I think we'd be looking at um, needing to bond money if it's a significant project. Okay, 
Well, I think I'd like to look think about our capital over the next five years, and maybe this is a question for the board at a different time when we're less um, we, brushed. I mean, we have a we do have a five year capital plan, and we yeah. certainly um, can you know show the board that I, I think we've presented that in the past, probably to the the previous board. So we can we can definitely get that on the agenda and, and present that to you folks. Thank you. And then another related question is how does, uh, you know, I'll just say like some of the other sustainable energy and let's just put RECs, how does that fit into this? Um, are they priced into the model? Uh, they're, they're, they're there in the purchase power expense, um, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, that's, that's where they, I think that's where they end up. And so just including, so our, I'll just say the environmental goals that we've passed and the previous board has passed, uh, and then we're still covering our costs and, and we're still kind of, that's, that's good to know. So that's, it's good to see that they're in the model already. Well, I, I see we're um, 10 minutes over um, and I, I gather uh, Craig and Mayhew, you'll be back. So, oh, yeah. I don't know what, what's the schedule for coming back to actually talking about um, the rate design and how these the, what changes actually need to be made. Um, I, I would say, I mean, um, how how often uh, how often are you meeting? Uh, are you meeting more than more than once a month? Because there'll be substantial uh, progress to report. In, in in less than a month uh, so well we right now we only have a, a meeting every month but we can schedule more meetings because I think this type of thing would, could easily take up a whole meeting yeah more uh, Roy I see your hand is up yeah thanks I, just a quick question is there going to be a recommendation to increase the customer charge because you've observed the difference between the the actual customer charge and a cost-based customer charge. Well, yeah, if I were to put together a recommendation today, it would probably be something to the effect that you want to phase in an increase to get to, to get to that $20 over three years or five years. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. That, that would be a recommendation. I, I would also mention, you know, I just looked at a few other uh, Muni's customer charge. I think uh, Concord is $16 and something. Wellesley and Reading, I think it was Reading I looked at, or like three, uh, four or five dollars. So I mean, there is a uh, you know uh, a, a, a public policy political component to that as well. Just to put one more piece on that, I took those numbers and then built a quick table to say kilowatt use jumping by twenty or two hundred kilowatts, um, and you pretty quickly flip from you know that comment that's a distribution charge is recovering the customer charge. After about a thousand kilowatt hours, you're um, actually it's after about 800 kilowatts, you're well past recovering the actual customer charge. Uh, and just thinking through sort of what signals send, I want to just put a pin in this that when we come back to look at the the over recovery that the distribution charge is doing for large consumers, thinking through electrification and sort of some of the push pull that, that comes from doing that. So we don't need to dive into that now, but just want to put pin for a subsequent conversation. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I, I don't know if there's more right now, but thank you, Mayhew. I know this is a lot of data to plow through and um, it's an enormous amount of work. So um, we thank you. Right. Uh, if I if I had to put a bottom line in this, I would say your rates aren't broken, but uh, you know they could they could always use some fine tuning. And okay. I'll stop sharing. Great. And, and may you just to pass along um, June twenty second, uh, as of right now, anyways, the the morning of June twenty second is our next light board meeting. So okay, uh, we should at least plan to present if we don't have something. Prior to that, um, you know, at least the five year, if not the yep. the other two parts of the uh, yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have a lot to talk about by then. Great, thanks. Um, luckily, I'm, luckily, I'm still around. All right, <laughs> thanks, Travis. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Craig, just quick, uh, we're just time of use is not in this conversation because we're just going to look at that after the pilot's over. Is that correct? 
Yeah, where time of use was a pilot and a very small subset of customers, yeah. relatively speaking. We kind of held that aside. We're paying attention to it, but no, we wanted to focus on, on the rates that we have existing today, yeah. So, sounds good, thanks. I assume so, if I just check, double checking. Okay, um, I guess we should move on to the next topic, um, power uh, cost adjustment. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I think I'll hang around for power cost adjustment just to listen, if that's okay. Great. You're welcome. Sure. I, I, I need to share my screen with the memo. Full disclosure, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Belmont Electric customer, so... <laughs> For a while. For a while, yeah. Okay, I, here it is. So you all got uh, uh, a memo, which provides some historical data on PCA, um, power cost adjustment clause, and how it is calculated and everything. We've been discussing for during couple past meetings, like at least starting January, that power costs are growing. We started noticing it back in the mid of last year, and it, it keeps growing. And uh, going through my typical uh, cost drop, uh, I came to the under collection for 2022, which we would like to obviously um, uh, collect because it's, it's, it's a path through cost and uh, that's what we're looking into. So uh, the total of a collection is, is a little bit higher than 300,000 for uh, as of today. So what I used, I used like actual sales, actual power costs for four months and tried to come to estimated amount. It adds additional uh, 0.43 cents uh, as a calculated uh, PCA uh, charge, additional charge to be added to the customer accounts, uh, customer bills. So effective June, we're looking to combine the previously set up PCA charge of 0.67 cents and the additional PCA charge, which will end up being 1.1 uh, cent per uh, kilowatt hour to be applied to customer uh, accounts effective June 2022. I can, like, on average, it will, uh, the, the, the total impact for the customer accounts would be like $5.5 per, uh, like, average 500 kilowatt hour uh, bill. Oh, wait, wait a second. Can I interrupt you there? It, yeah. the, it, the increase is only is less than that though, right? right. So yes, yeah, so we have existing existing PCA charge of 0.67 cents. The additional uh, charge to be implemented effective June is 0.43 cents, which ends up to, to provide a total of 1.1 cent per kilowatt hour effective June. But the previous page, um, I think uh, the next step shows it's $2.15 yes. there. Um, yeah. is the additional cost uh, that the PCA adjustment would bring in on the average customer's bill um, this year. So we had um, the under collection late last year, which as Maria just mentioned, we, we put the PCA adjustment in place at the uh, in February. And then um, we're continuing to see uh, natural gas prices rise and, and stay elevated. Um, so looking at our projections this year and where we are already, we're projecting an, uh, another under collection uh, uh, this year as well. And so we want to get out in front of that as uh, quickly as possible to minimize the amount of um, collection that we might have to, to make. So what we'll be doing is putting that um, 0 0.0043 starting June 1st for this year's projected under collection. And as we go through the cost of service and we adjust our rates, if we adjust our rates, um, we can um, stop collecting that or even uh, credit that back if, uh, if we find that's the case that we need to do. But uh, we think it's prudent to move forward quickly to uh, start collecting and give us a longer runway so that it's not a bigger number like we found our situation in last year at the end of the year. 
Greg, can I ask a quick clarifying question just for my own um, reference? I, I feel like in the past we've referenced the average Belmont customer uses about a thousand kilowatt hours a month. The math here is pretty simple to, to double it if that's true, but just is, is 500 kilowatts an appropriate annual Belmont light on average customer use or, you know, I mean, $2, four dollars those are small numbers so I, I think the overall impact remains fairly de minimis to, to your average customer but just to sure uh, it's it's more becca's question i believe but that we typically for the estimates like that we're using 500 kilowatt hours uh average usage um like where you were referring specifically to residential customers because a thousand is very high uh, for a resi customer, it's four fifty for low income and five fifty for average residential. Thank you. I, um, I I'm not sure where I got thousand from, but I, I <laughs> obviously mistaken. So I'm glad I asked the question. Thank you both. Um, I want to make sure I, I I read the memo and I see that you know the the current point sorry point six cents the current PCA. Uh huh. Yeah. Wait now now I'm. Six yeah. point six seven was no. was voted on was voted on in January, and then on the second the bottom of the second page. Yes. Oh so, wait, okay. I I think I get it now. Thank you. Okay. No, I see it. I I do see it now. I I I read the memo wrong the first time. So thank you. Yeah, we we try to break it down in three pieces. So page one is really historical from last year. Um, this middle section on page two, upper section, is, is what we're proposing for this year. And then the lower section is the total of impact for both pieces. Right. So there's a 2021 under collection of a little over 100,000. There's a 2022 under collection of uh, somewhat over 200,000. And that's what's being um, collected in this 43 mil additional PCA charge. Um, going forward, wouldn't given the fact that you're also collecting for 2021, wouldn't the 43 mils be more than what you need? The 43 mils is strictly for the um, the 300, just slightly over 300 thousand dollars that we project to under collect this year. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, if, if if everything moves forward as as projected. Um, basically, at the end of this year, the entirety of the PCA would would go away, and then I guess we reevaluate at the beginning of next year. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, if there are no other questions, I guess we need to to vote on this, Craig. See if, if I, I, I and I think I know where I stand, but I just want to to say it explicitly. This is sort of a special adjustment to PCA sort of reflecting exactly what is happening now, which is then to say, I, I think it is fair, we are somewhat deviating from our sort of established policy of an annual PCA adjustment. I recognize as much as everybody else that there are special circumstances, power prices are behaving essentially unprecedented spikes is it appropriate to make a, I'm not sure if it's fair to say out of cycle PCA adjustment. I understand why we're doing this, but just to say, is it better to hold our sort of annual PCA adjustment to come back in sort of the January time period and, and make that sort of for that period versus doing this now? Um, I think there are pluses and minuses to doing both of those, but before we proceed to a vote, I just want to make sure that I'm thinking about that as, as similar to everybody else and that the rationale and justification to do that is, is appropriate. I, I'm not for or against doing this. I just want to make sure. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I guess if I could answer that, I, I, a couple of things there. Um, first, I, I, you mentioned an annual a policy or an annual PCA adjustment. Um, I'm not so sure that that's, that's correct. Uh, so our, our PCA um, tariff, if you will, basically says that we will, um, we will look at, you know, continuously monitor our costs and implement a PCA adjustment uh, if necessary. 
Um, I'm not sure that, you know, maybe there was some thought that we can make this an annual type of look, but we do this continuously. And, um, you know, in this particular case, because the natural gas prices are not relenting, if you will, we figured um, and, you know, thought that this would be at the right time with um, plenty, you know, of runway here in the year to uh, to implement that and try to not have a bigger hill to climb if the if the rates continue to rise. Um, and then the second thing, just for the board's sake, um, this is, uh, I, I guess you could vote to recommend or to agree. It's not really needed as a vote, but i um, happy to have you folks uh, weigh in on that. Because we're not adjusting rates per se. So obviously rates are under the, the board's purview. Um, a PCA adjustment, uh, because as Mayhew said previously, we're, we're governed to have all of our costs or power supply as a pass through. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're adjusting our, uh, using the PCA to adjust that to collect what we project to be an under collection for the year. Right, right. Uh, let's say I think we have Roy and Andy, I guess you had your hand up first. I see. Um, <clears throat> one piece I wanted to clarify was just the timing here. Um, I want Steve, I think you just mentioned we'd look at this again uh, at the beginning of 2023, but I want to make sure maybe I'm misunderstanding. Does this get looked at quarterly? Like would Maria and team be looking at this in Q4 of this year to see where we're tracking and, and revisit this later in the year? Is that right? Good. Yeah, so, so typically what happens, we during budget cycle, and it's partial answers Michael question as well, uh, during budget cycle, we set up a base cost of power, which I use to, to run true ups of the costs and actual costs and sales. So then typically every quarter, if I see that costs are going significantly high, I do it more frequently, but typically every quarter I, I do a true up of actual costs using that base base cost of power set up during set up annually and see is the over or under collection do we need pc how much it is by the end of the year are we are we okay and it's always up to the management decision to say okay it looks like we're under collecting a lot let's implement pc or it seems like we're okay we can skip for now let's look another month so typically answering your question, Andy, yes, we do it quarterly. Occasionally, I do it more frequently. Thank you. Appreciate it. Roy? Um, I... Roy, you frozen? I think he might have froze. Yeah, looks like he jumped off. You're on mute, but your video's back. Sorry, Zoom threw me off for a second. Um, it, it, it seems to me that the need for PCA uh, largely arises from the unhedged part of the portfolio because where we're, where we're hedged, then we're insulated from, say, the market spikes that happened this year. But because we have 20% or so that's unhedged, that, that unanticipated cost increase is, I think, the main reason why the undercollection arises. Um, in terms of how to deal with that, you know, there are competing um, considerations. One is the prices that you charge should uh, correlate with the cost that you incur. At the same time, you, you may want not, you don't want to have uh, price adjustments that are too frequent because that's just uh, burdensome. Uh, that said, uh, there's nothing um, intrinsically more correct about doing it annually versus some other frequency, but I would suggest that you track, as I think Maria was just explaining, uh, track the degree of over or under collection that you're actually experiencing. And if it, if it exceeds a certain threshold, then you, sh you should really take action 
regardless of the timing. So if you're suddenly two or three hundred thousand dollars behind, um, I think you should you should think about a PCA adjustment just so the deficit doesn't get too big and you have an even bigger adjustment down the road. So I, I would think about it more pragmatically that if you're if you're under a rover collection is within a tolerable band, just leave it be and see where you are at the end of the year. But if you exceed some reasonable threshold, then just act regardless of the timing. Yeah, I would um, agree with you wholeheartedly there, Roy. Um, and that's in fact what we do. Um, it's only because of the, uh, the change in the market with natural gas prices that we're acting uh, sooner. Um, which is probably where the one-year review of a PCA is coming from, from people's thought processes. Um, we typically do that. We typically ride out um, in the beginning of the year, the, the cooler and colder months, we tend to go into a, a deficit where we're under collecting. And then through the summer months, we um, earn that back. But this year, looking at the forecast and looking at the gas price forecast, um, those cost is staying elevated. And that's why we felt it was necessary to act sooner rather than uh, wait till the end of the year. Okay, great. Uh, we are as expected behind, behind schedule, but um, that sounds good. Unless there's anything else, I guess we will, uh, you will implement that uh, 43 mil increase to 1.1 cents per kilowatt hour on June 1st. And we'll uh, keep monitoring to see where things uh, are going. Uh, next up on the agenda is the um, discussion and vote and report to the DPU, Department of Public Utilities. Yes, um, so this little bit strange this year because of the change in the board, but uh, typically this goes hand in hand with our financials. And uh, in the past, because uh, Roy Epstein being on the call th this morning, uh, he's on the permanent audit committee and um, Bob Forrester, um, who uh, is, was on LBAC, our, our advisory committee, are both on the permanent audit committee. They're usually involved in, um, you know, very intimately in our, in our finances. So um, we, we do require signatures from the board on our DPU report. And um, it's usually just kind of a matter of practice. But in this case, with the changes that uh, at the board level, what we're asking is um, we sent out the, the DPU report that is built off of all the uh, numbers that come from our financial statements. We do plan um, to bring the financial statements to the board at June's meeting. Um, as you saw, our agenda is pretty full today, so we, we didn't want to bog it down, um, but we didn't want it to, to just sit and languish either. So. If the board is comfortable, um, happy to answer any questions on the DPU report if there are any. Um, but basically, we I, I have the last page, the signature page, here in our front office, and, and I, I would ask if the board could come by at their leisure and sign off on that page so that we can uh, prepare the, the, the entire document and send that over to the, the Department of Public Utilities um, as our yearly submittal. Um, and then, like, as I mentioned, we will have a, a deep discussion uh, next month on our audited financials, which is the year-end financials from last year, as well as our first quarter financials for this year. We'll, we'll be bringing that in front of the board. Michael? Steve, um, Craig, I, that's additional helpful information. When I looked at the materials that were sent out um, and scrolled to, what is this page, I believe 45 of 46, where the signatures are on it, um, I, I think the one hesitation that I, I'd like just a little more understanding on, and, and Roy, maybe if you've done this previously, I appreciate your perspective. It's not entirely clear what I am signing other than the report, putting my signature on it. It doesn't say, you know, I certify that this is accurate or true to the best of my understanding. If that's what I am signing, I, I think I would need a little more time and diligence to, to work through a fairly comprehensive report. Or is it just simply saying that this was, you know, like I certify that I've received a copy of this. I, I'm, I think I'm just confused because there's nothing on the form that says, 
my signature represents this other than literally pen marks on a piece of paper. So to the extent that what exactly our board signature on this document entails, I, I would appreciate a deeper understanding perspective before going forward. Does that make sense? Yep, yep, makes sense. Um, no, I think what you're signing is is the fact that the document, what's on that document is accurate and, and correct. Um, the numbers that we're reporting, uh, power supply, as you go through that, there's, there's a lot of numbers there. Um, and what I was um, trying to get at was those numbers that are placed on that report are, are placed there after our audited financial statements. Um, they're pulled right from that. So through the process of going through our financial statements and, and through the permanent audit committee process, um, there's a comfort level that those numbers are correct. And then it's really just a, um, a process to have uh, the board sign off on the, on the document. In this case, because the change in, in, in the board here, um, the existing, the new board wasn't part of that process. Um, so if it's uh, more comfort to the board, there isn't a, um, a rush on the uh, DPU report. If you prefer, we could hold off on signing that until after we go through the um, ERN statements and, and pre present those to you at next month's meeting so that uh, there's a better comfort level there if, if, if that's um, you know what you wish. And uh, Michael, I mean, that's a good question. I guess I never really thought deeply about what it means to sign this report, but um, you know, somebody has to take responsibility for it. And I believe it's appropriate for the light board to do that, not because you're investigating every number, but because you are, as a board, taking responsibility for the staff work that went involved, that, that went into producing it in the first place. And then if, if some issue arises, then you would be res take responsibility for rectifying whatever problem might arise. I don't, I don't, I don't think it generates any you know, liability of some sort. Other, than, I think it's just a statement that you are the responsible parties. Yeah, I, I will say that uh, just to remind everyone that obviously local control, the board is our DPU, if you will. So what we file with the Department of Public Utilities is really more of a um, a good faith gesture, just giving them the document. I think they just post it, and that there's nothing that they do with it. They're not going to go through it like. Uh, the IRS would on your tax return and check things. They're just taking it and filing it as, you know, checking the box type of thing. Really, you folks do serve as our our DPU, quite honestly, for the for the town. So um, that's you know if that means anything. But it's it's less about um, a requirement and more about just kind of following a process that they recommend we do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've looked through it briefly. It looks fine. I'm happy to sign it. Um, when I worked at the DPU, these things were just filed as a matter of course. No one ever looked at them, but um, th not to say that somebody couldn't. Um, but there's no way that I'm going to ever be able to would have enough time to go through and verify every number in there. And I have to rely on others to do that. I think that makes sense. And, and thank you both Craig and Roy for the, the additional perspective there. Um, given that we are not on a time crunch to do this and recognizing everything that we've just said, I might be inclined to say to hold signature until after if we are going to actually talk to this next month um, to, to sort of at least from my perspective, maybe come down after we go through that. Um, but if, if I understood you, Craig, correctly, we're going to put some time and effort into to sort of digging into some of what will be in here on next month's meeting. There's no necessarily specific urgency. So just for my own sort of diligence perspective, I might sort of, I guess I'm checking with you if, if that feels yeah. appropriate, amenable, works for the timeline. If not, I can sort of take time today and review it this afternoon and come down and sign it today. But I, if, if we're going to be discussing more of the content of this on next month's call, I, I might um, sort of softly float that consideration to, to sign it after that time. Yeah, we'll definitely be, be going through our year-end financials next month. 
And as I said, um, not all the data in the in the DP report is born from that, but some of it in, is. So um, if that gives you know a better comfort level of what what's in the DP report, then then yes, that that's perfectly fine to do that. Um, as I mentioned, it's not uh, we don't have a deadline to send in the the DP report. It's uh, just a, a process that we do every year, and it it usually goes hand in hand with our financials at time wise. So, so I I, I could I couldn't remember. Is there? There's no June thirtieth deadline on these. I can't remember. No, 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 not anymore. They extended it until September, so we we're flexible here. Oh. It would be nice to have a signed report on our website, but it's there's no necessity to do it that quickly. Okay. All right. I mean, if everybody's all right with that, we'll just hold it then um, uh, for the next meeting. All right. All right. Uh, we are, what, about 20 minutes behind schedule. We're up yeah. to the general manager update. Yep. I'll run through these very quickly, try to get some time here. Um, I just wanted to point out a few things that are that have been going on here at Belmont Light. Um, Chenery uh, School Solar Array. Um, Carla, um, and I'm going to mispronounce her last name, so I'll just avoid to. Um, she is going to host a ribbon cutting ceremony at the Chenery School. It's on Friday, uh, May 27th from 9 to 10 a.m. So um, just wanted to um, let the board know that. Obviously, everyone's invited if you'd like to attend. Uh, as you know, Belmont Light in particular, our assistant GM, Sam Osmanjevic, was very uh, integral to that project. So uh, we'll be there to, um, to celebrate that and, and welcome the board's participation. Yeah, Sam was really instrumental in that. He should be given uh, some kudos for, for his efforts. Maybe help hold the scissors. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Can I just, real quick, is anybody else planning to attend that? Because obviously, if, if more than the quorum of, of the board shows up, we I believe trigger a, a situation. I, I'm interested, and it's right, you know, I'm, I'm right across from the middle school, and I, I think everybody here loves solar, but I do as well and, and wanted to attend, uh, but I, I don't want to create a situation. I, I think we can all show up as long as we don't say anything. Isn't that right, Roy? Um, yes, but you can post it as a meeting. It doesn't hurt. Um, but it's, you know, in general, if it's kind of, a, it's more like a social event, um, it's not really a meeting where the business is discussed. So, but I, I think in the past out of an excess of caution, we've posted things as meetings just because there are some litigious, um, people out there who are, uh, just didn't want to give them an opportunity to criticize us. This is talking about other uh, bodies, by the way. Um, anyway, so just your point, Michael, I don't know if anyone else is planning to go. I might walk over, but if someone else would prefer to do that, that's fine too. Again, I'm, I'm more worried about deliberation, so I kind of agree that's probably more on the social side. But I just to answer the question, I, will, I would love to attend, but I'll be uh, unable to. So uh, congratulations, uh, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm tentative. I'm hoping to make it, but it's um, uh, my schedule on Friday is a little up in the air right now. Dave? Uh, I have to say it was Andy. I'm tentative also. <laughs> <laughs> make it hard All for right. you. Well, if, if I walk over and I see two other people there, I'll leave. So. Is there a rule we have to stand 50 feet apart or something? I mean, <laughs> yeah, and, and you have to have a mask on. And, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, I guess we can move on then. Yep. Um, I wanted to uh, just um, inform the board of the supply chain. I know we talked last meeting about supply chain, but we talked specifically about transformers. Um, what I wanted to just kind of clue you in on this time is we're seeing the same issue with all of our needs and in particular now wires become an issue for us so um belmont uh belmont's underground uh, system on our main roads such as concord ave and uh, brighton street and some of the other main drags 
Um, it's built in a, um, it's called tile duct. It's, it's square conduit basically. And, and it's turn of the century construction, very similar to Eversource's uh, system. And so to fit the wire in, the, in those conduits that we require for our load, uh, we have to order a special wire. It's called flat strap neutral wire. So it has a flat neutral wire as opposed to a round wire as one of the conductors, which makes allows it to fit in those conduits. Um, in the past, that was never a problem getting that wire because Eversource needed that wire. And, and so they were producing it. Our manufacturer was producing it for Eversource and, and putting some aside for us. That's become a, an issue with the uh, supply demands for the raw materials for wire. And so uh, we're now being told by our supplier that we're looking at a minimum of basically 10 months to over a year to get that wire uh, in stock. Uh, they're so far behind that even Eversource doesn't have what they need for their, for their needs. So what that means for us is that the wire that we do have in stock, we, we need to kind of squirrel that away for emergencies. If we ever have a cable failure, those types of things that we have the wire on hand to, um, to use in those situations. But unfortunately, what that means is it's going to slow us down a little bit with our voltage conversion work. Um, there are other jobs that we can do. There's overhead wire, for instance. There's, there's plenty of work for us to do in our voltage conversion, but um, to pretend that this doesn't impact us would be a lie. So I, I just wanted to just let the board know that that's going on. Um, again, not unlike transformers, not unlike other bigger equipment, but it, it's definitely uh, an impact to us and is going to you know cause us to kind of reevaluate which projects we do when. Um, Andy, you got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, just wondering if there's any considerations around stockpiling. If you have to, um, you know, if you if you you know coming out of this material shortage concern, you know, um, if you're trying to dollar cost average and stockpile some of the harder to some of the materials that you th think might be suspect of future instability, um, you know, you how are you for storage um, facilities and you know, like, is there any boundaries on that, right? Like, are you just want to think through the problem? Yep, yep. Um, so we are stockpiling, if you will, some some cable um, for that reason in, in particular. Uh, however, that said, we do have minimal storage capacity here at the light department property, um, actually the DPW property, I should say. So um, there's only so much that we can do under those but in this particular case, with this type of wire, it's not even, if they had it and we could get it, we'd figure out a way to store it. At this point, they can't even make it. And that's really the impact that we're feeling right now. So uh, they told us um, 40 weeks is the beginning uh, of when they could produce it for us. Um, and I think we're, we're, we believe it's gonna be over a year before um, it's readily available again for us. So uh, we do have some in stock, like I said, and, We'll be very selective of what projects we move forward, keeping in mind that we need to have something on hand if we ever have those emergencies. Knock on wood that we don't have those emergencies, uh, but uh, you know we'd be ill prepared if we didn't uh, keep some of it. And it's not the entire system. I mean, we have plenty of areas in town where we have robust uh, conduits where uh, they're five inch in diameter. We can pull conventional underground wire in there of the right size and, and uh, shape that we need. This is only in select areas, but it, unfortunately, a lot of our circuitry runs right down Concord Ave, and, and that's a big, big piece of this. So um, that's why I wanted to bring it forward. Uh, Craig, I'm curious, you mentioned this is impacting the rollout of the, the conversion um, voltage upgrade. Uh, is the wire required for the new newer voltage or the older voltage or both? The newer voltage. So it's 15 and, KV class wire. And so, uh, okay. So, um, okay. That's just, I'm just trying to think about uh, the situation of the emergencies and what wire is going out. So this would be the parts of the system that have already been converted, but somehow fail. So, okay. Thanks. That's what we want to keep it on hand for. Um, it's not just for the area that's already been converted. So what we've been doing for many years now is if we replace any wire, whether uh, a section in an emergency or a whole circuit, 
we build it to the new standard, which is 15,000 volt standard. Uh, the old 4,000 volt standard, we, that's no longer being installed. Okay, um, moving along. So uh, flow EV charges. I just wanted to let the board know that we did put an RFP out for EV charges for, for level two charges. And we're awarding that bid to flow. Um, we're looking through the agreement as we speak and um, dot and I's and cross and T's, but that um, is the best um, financial um, charger for, for Belmont Light. So um, they came in with a, a very good um, cost and we'll be going over to them as we start to look at installing those throughout, throughout town. Um, with that, in concert with that, um, we finally got the official word that the grant that we won for the DC fast charger that we put in for a while back, we just got a final word of that um, just a week ago. So uh, happy to report that. We've been told uh, via email that we had won that, but we just got the official notification that we did in fact win that. And uh, we'll be purchasing a DC fast charger for the Claflin street lot. and. Uh, looking to do some construction there. Great. Mike, your hands up. Thanks, Craig. Um, can you, I, I'm not sure if I missed this, the level two chargers that Flow will be, or we will be purchasing, Flow will be providing, those are for general public consumption. They'll be placed around town. Those are specific for Belmont Light. Could you just re-articulate exactly where the intended use of those is and, and maybe roughly how many of them we're thinking? Sure, so we've got uh, several locations in town that we would like to, to put um, level two charges. We're looking at the uh, Waverly Square area with the Church Street lot. So we've been talking with the town about um, the, the particulars of, of how we would um, take some of those parking spaces for, for, for charging. Um, obviously, Claflin Street, uh, the charges that are there actually have been there for quite a while now. So we're, we're, we're going to need to be upgrading those pretty pretty soon. And um, we've been talking with um, McLean Hospital about putting some charges up on their property. The senior center has reached out and asked if we could put a charger on their property for their residents. So we're trying to find the, the right locations. The high school uh, has been on our radar for quite a while to help support not only the uh, the school and faculty during the, the day, but during the summer months would be um, used by the area residents, you know, for, for their uh, use in, in the evening hours. So we're, we're looking at where, where it makes sense, um, all different, you know, um, possibilities, whether it be uh, street side parking along a curb or uh, parking spaces such as a, you know, Claflin Street lot with their, their parking spots. So, um, we're looking at that now, working on a couple of projects, how to get our facilities in those those locations. Thank you, Craig. So I'll just my comment was just simply on the order of uh, EV charging network was also in my thought when we had a previous conversation around capital and uh, five year capital plans. So I uh, hope that's on the list. So thank you. Yep. Yeah, these for like as I said, we have a five-year capital plan, and these projects are identified and, and put in there um, more in a dollar number, you know. But we have uh, many projects that we we try to uh, you know keep moving at the same time. Uh, Craig, are the new chargers going to come with um, uh, a fee for use attached to them? Uh, do you have the software, and has a decision been made on the billing system? So the they will come with a fee. So any any charger that's installed in the um, in the public uh, for public use will have a a cost associated with with uh, using those chargers. Um, I don't recall the the numbers, but we did bring that to the previous light board, and and they voted in a um, a, a a fee for that. We're going to evaluate that. Obviously, it's very similar to our PCA uh, conversation. We'll, we'll make sure that with the, the cost of these charges and that, that all kind of pencils out. And if there's a change needed, we can always bring that back to, uh, to the board. Um, and then we'll probably be meeting as well with the board of selectmen as we get into or the select board, as we get into um, 
what locations in town might, uh, you know, that we'd like to put these in so that the town's looped into where these charges are going to be placed as well. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and then um, fuel tank discussion. I, I This was really, I just wanted to, again, inform the board that, um, as Roy can to attest to, there's been an ongoing conversation about the fuel tanks here at the DPW yard. And uh, I think they have a plan now that we'll be going to town meeting to um, to install new fuel tanks. Really just wanted to let the board know that Belmont Light was uh, still committed to contributing our share of, of capital costs to the uh, to those fuel tanks for our, for our use, you know. Um, in particular, it's the diesel fuel that is important to me with our line trucks having those, um, being able to fuel up for all those off hour storms. You know, it seems like every time we have a storm, it's off hours, it's after 4 p.m. and, and through the night. So um, we find that diesel fuel to be extremely important and having it readily available here at the yard is a, is a big plus to us. So um, we're happy to uh, contribute our share of, of cost to that. It'll be a capital asset on our books and uh, it'll be depreciated over time. So we're not just giving the town a, a, you know, a bucket of, of money. We're, we're actually buying a percentage of the uh, fuel tank uh, from a capital expense. And then uh, lastly- Well, I Mark, just oh, mentioned, unfortunately, ahead. the cost of those tanks has gone up um, significantly in the last, I don't know, three or four months, unfortunately. And also, um, for those who haven't been following it, this has been a huge issue um, in town meeting and uh, community about whether to be above ground tanks, which would be less expensive, um, or below ground tanks. And um, uh, it, it's uh, also a cautionary tale about trying to cite anything in town and um, I think about that in terms of um, energy storage as well. Yep. Craig, uh, when you last showed the share that Belmont Light had, I feel like it wasn't always lined up perfectly with the usage. Uh, is there any been any commitment or any agreements with the fraction of the costs um, that Belmont Light would be covering? So the the cost has been looked at from a percentage base. What our percentage of use has been, um, it has been rounded up a little bit from that from that number. I think to to Steve's point, the cost has increased, in my opinion, pretty dramatically from last year to to this year. So um, last year there was some discussion that we were paying a little bit too much for our share of that. Um, at this point, it's it's more in line because of the the overall project cost has increased greatly. So we're still we're still looking at that $200,000 level that we committed to um, last year. And again, that will be all dependent so, on town meeting. If it's so, passed by town meeting. So I just want to be say like from the board's the from the financial perspective of Belmont Light, it's a it's a fixed number, not a percentage of of around of, around, of, of $200,000, can I say specifically? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and that, that, that works out to our percentage of use uh, with a slight roundup, but it's, it's, it's in, that, in, in that ballpark. So that, that's a good number for, for our involvement. Uh, Roy, what is the overall number now? Is it like 1.9 million, something like that? <clears throat> well, it's, it's a cautionary tale and the price of delay, yeah. The price has gone from about a million to a million nine we're hoping that a million nine is actually an outer bounds worst case because it has a very big contingency built into it but that's the order of magnitude and we could have done it if we approved it last year it would have been what five hundred thousand mm, no the whole project i think uh, for above ground last year was 1.03 oh. 1.03 has become 1.9 for above ground or below ground um well, there. Doesn't that, matter. That's above ground. The, Doesn't I mean, matter. Anyway, we're we're in the one. We're about one point nine. Uh, it's one one point seven for above ground. The way I counted, one point nine for underground. 
uh, anyway, it's going to be on the June town meeting warrant. So yeah. we'll see if that passes. Yeah. And then um, lastly, um, as Travis mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, um, I wanted to talk about the energy committee. Um, we have a, a candidate internally who's interested in um, putting his name uh, for consideration. But I, it was uh, per the charter of the energy committee. I just wanted to throw this out there. Um, there is a, a light department or, or someone connected to the light department can be appointed to that board. But I'm not sure if that comes through the light board or the board of the select board. Uh, it says the light board on the charter, but all other positions go to the select board. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there for the board. Uh, someone may need to speak with uh, maybe the clerk and see how the, those applications come in and, and who, you know how that gets uh, assigned. I well, you should double check this with Patrice and the charge. I. If it's a light board appointment, I think it's entirely the light board. There are appointments made by the select board. Some appointments and other committees are made by the school committee. And this would be, I think this is just a straight light board appointment. Okay, that's how the charge is laid out. Yeah, so I just so, wasn't sure. All right, so I'm confused. So we're appointing someone to be a liaison to the energy committee? And I, actually, it's a, it would be a member of the Energy Committee. Yeah, depending so, on the charge, clear. it's either yeah. liaison or a voting member. I'm not sure how the charge uh, is written. Okay. And Travis, I'm maybe we'll pull it up fast. So, and, and for the reference, yeah, sorry, I was going to give the background. For the reference, I've been doing this. Uh, the select board serving as the light board um, chose me. So I've been representing. I was both an Energy Committee member, I guess, and an LBAC and uh, representing the light board on the Energy Committee. And uh, I'm choosing to not re-up this summer. It's been six years, and, and I'd be happy to have uh, someone else have an opportunity. Um, so uh, that's why there's, I guess, an open spot in, in the light board. We have the ability to nominate someone else, and it could be, again, one of our one of ourselves, or it could be, uh, I guess, Craig, you mentioned an internal candidate. Right. So I, I, I guess what I'll do is... Um... We can talk with the, the clerk, I guess, but I can direct the candidate to send the application to the light board. We can send it to the board for, for your consideration. And, and um, I'm not sure of the dates, um, Travis, when, when you're... Um, I think it's always July 1st is the, technically the board year, board cycle. Does that sound right, Roy? Something like that, isn't that? Uh, technically fine. July 1st, but if... If uh, a new appointee is not available, then the old person technically continues on until the replacement does become available. Yeah. And I'm reading the charge and it says one representative of Belmont Light who may, who may but need not be in a Belmont Light employee and who is designated by the light board is how it reads. So. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's all I had. I'll, I'll um, just in the interest of time, it's in, it is important when we get to executive session. So I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll shut I, I up just, and let, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to mention <clears throat> one more uh, news item, which, um, which is Bob Forrester, who has been, uh, of course, instrumental with LBAC and before that MLAB and with the post audit committee. Um, I don't know if uh, everyone's aware he has some health issues, was in the hospital for quite a while. His daughter did write me um, a long email, and I, she didn't want me to, to go into details about what it is. But I think he'd appreciate it if um, people would, um, you know, uh, contact him through email and wish him well. He's he's home now and recuperating, so uh, hopefully all will be well. But um, it sounded like a, a bit of a struggle for a while. Okay, uh, professional affiliation update, Michael. Yeah, I'll be real quick. I just wanted to let everybody know, um, uh, as of the end of this month, I will no longer be employed by NL North America. Um, I am leaving that company and taking up an opportunity with the World Resource Institute. I flag this mostly for the light board and for Craig and really for everybody's general awareness. I don't think it has come up, but there's always the perception of a conflict of interest. NL North America manufactures, sells, distributes EV chargers, battery storage systems, solar, wind, all sorts of resources that Belmont Light has um, 
expressed express interest and uh, transacted with. So as of the end of this month, they'll no longer be employed within L North America. And um, I think any perception of, of a potential conflict of interest should be uh, sort of fully distinguished or extinguished at that point. And um, just wanted to, to give that news to the board and, and everybody else in town. The you know, That's all I've got on that agenda topic. Thank you. And you wanted to also talk a little bit about, uh, talk briefly about ISO New England voting. Yep. Um, so agenda, what is that? Five, six, seven, eight. Um, I, as also leaving Anel, who is a NEPO member, um, without going into the nuances of how NEPO works, um, I essentially represented a different entity at a different voting position with different interests there, which um, again could lead to a perception of a conflict of interest. Stepping down from that role and away from, from NEPO at large, wanted to just flag, we've had one instance so far where there was a, a particularly high impact regional issue. <clears throat> Belmont Light is a voting member at NEPO. And to ensure that sort of our town, our light department um, sort of perspective and approach to engagement with the markets, our, our sort of overall guiding documents are well reflected to basically just sort of put a forward looking pin into there will be issues that come up for vote at NEPOL. I'm not suggesting in any way that the board or Craig or Belmont Light necessarily has to dedicate additional time, energy, and bandwidth to what can be exceedingly complicated topics, but do want to just sort of set up a process by which we will be prepared to handle on an appropriate timeline what I think can be incredibly relevant issues for sort of regional policy where our town should be expressing our views. We have um, strong climate commitment goals. There are opportunities for those goals can be well reflected in sort of regional policy, ISO New England tariff structure, and done so in a way that balances both uh, need to maintain costs at appropriate levels, reliability at, at sort of the, the utmost highest degree, but also support some of the um, uh, sort of more climate positive market rule considerations that can be done. So there's nothing specific that I have where it's, hey, next month, this is going to be voted. Um, but just to sort of say, let's let's have this be something that the board is, is aware of. Um, Craig, you and I talked about this briefly, and you know, I, we don't need to belabor the point today, but just to say, going forward, I would like this to become something that we're uh, well suited in position to anticipate, handle, and take action on. So that's all I wanted to say there, Craig. I don't know if there's anything else, but um, well, I, I just add that um, not unlike Dave Cavanaugh joining us, um, I think back uh, as uh, an L back uh, or as a committee uh, a couple months back there. I'll I'll continue to ask Dave, uh, maybe quarterly, maybe uh, depending on what's going on. I guess kind of talk to the board and come in and give us the state of what's going on in Nepal. And as I recognize things that uh, are either in conflict with what the Belmont um, um, idea is or, or vice versa, I'll bring those forward as well. So um, we'll do our best to kind of stay on top of things that way and bring, bring pertinent information to the board when needed. Okay, thank you. Um, we're uh, a well over schedule. I just wanted to have a check here. Does anybody have a hard stop at any particular time? It looks like we're going to be going past 930. So I just wanted to check. If not, okay. Um, I, I do think it's important to uh, ha have some public comments. So the next uh, item on the agenda was public comment. So if anyone would like to um on mute and uh raise their hand for comment this would be the time <clears throat> uh michael steve i don't want to cut anybody off in the public but before we wrap this up i just want to make one quick note on behalf of someone of the public that reached out to me as a board member I'm not hearing anybody, so 
Go I, ahead. I, Go ahead. Jump in. Um, I was asked by uh, a resident in town who's considering um, or interested in installing a, a solar system on their, their rooftop solar residential behind the meter PV system. They inquired, are we aware of or we're planning to deploy any new incentive structure similar to what was recently operated in the town where there was the state and the, the Belmont Light sort of matching funds, recognizing that has expired. Um, I encourage that individual to, to join this meeting, ask the question, um, but also noted that I would uh, raise this on their behalf. So um, I don't have any details beyond just sort of a curiosity of, of what additional incentives might be available for the town. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, Craig. I don't know if you've got anything to say here. Um, and I also see Roy, you came off mute, but um, just asking on behalf of a resident. Yep. Um, I'll just add that, um, you know, we are looking at our, our rebate programs. Um, to Mike's point, the, the, the existing one that had matching DOER funds at the Department of um, Environmental um, has come to an end. So we've, uh, we've taken a pause. We've spent significant money on the, on the solar program. We are through the uh, meme organization, um, the um, you know the Massachusetts grouping of, of utilities. We've we've asked our uh, state legislators to uh, have the, the DOER uh, resupply that uh, program and to provide that program again. Um, you know, waiting on answers on that, but we are looking internally at what we can do with the funds that we have for our um, our programs internally. And I think that. Uh, We'll get into a deeper conversation, maybe around the rate design with Mayhew on how we can do that, uh, how best do that. So um, that's about what I have right now for that. Uh, Michael, I would just add that uh, I'm happy to work with Belmont Light if they want. I have all my models from 2015 uh, that were. I think worked great then, but they were calibrated for conditions as they were seven years ago and happy to adapt them for whatever is going on now. Thank you, Roy. Um, and I'll say just very briefly, Craig, I, the, the sort of technology agnostic incentive program design is, is I think particularly interesting. So when and if we get the opportunity to talk about that, I, I support. Yeah, that's, yeah, good to hear. What, so what Mike's referring to is, uh, you know, there's, there's different ideas out there on how maybe to provide funding sources for customers. So instead of a rebate specifically eyed towards um, a solar array, maybe there's a, a program where we could provide some funding. Uh, I'll just say like a zero rate, uh, zero interest rate type of loan and a customer can then use that loan, whether it be battery storage, whether it be solar or some other um, you know, avenue. Um, so we're looking into things of that nature. Uh, and we'll bring those to the board as as we you know start to develop those, and um, maybe see what Roy's got as well, and, and go from there. Okay, great. Hearing no, not, nothing else from anyone on the call. We'll move on to uh, uh, where are we scheduling a future meetings? So I guess there's two elements here. It occurs to me. One is how many meetings do we have to have? And two is what time of day those meetings should be held at. So um, as I mentioned uh, to some of you that um, uh, in talking to Ellen Cushman, town clerk, she opined that um, there could be a perception that we're not being as welcoming to public comment and public participation by holding meetings early in the morning. Um, Ellen certainly isn't um, uh, our boss and she doesn't tell us what to do, but I do um, trust and you know, believe her. Uh, she's very sensitive to what's going on in town. And I do get the sense in town meeting that there are a group of people um, that, that feel that uh, there isn't enough transparency and uh, that more should be done in terms of um, making meetings available uh, for active participation by residents. Uh, so uh, that 
you know, we've been having our meetings at early in the morning. Um, the light board has had its meetings um, before the select board meetings, sort of 5.30 to 7. Um, and I guess that 5 to 7 slide is a, also a possibility for uh, uh, our meetings. Uh, so I'll open it up. I mean, I, I guess I have, uh, especially if we go back to in-person meetings, I think that possibly it would be perceived and as be more open to do it from, you know, five to seven. I know that's not ideal. And, and, uh, I say five to seven because there's tons of meetings, town meetings that typically start at seven or seven thirty. Um, and, uh, that's 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 one one option that we could go to, but I'm just one vote, and I don't know how everyone else feels about that. Uh, Craig and everyone else on the on the call. Yeah. So um, I apologize, Steve. That the date of um, of the meeting, um, I don't know if that was uh, a Monday that you were referring to or, or something else, but. Uh, you mentioned five to seven as far as a time in the evening uh, of meeting. Did you mention on, on what day of the week or any? No, no, I just, no, no. I mean, our next meeting is scheduled for 7.30 in the morning, and I think we'll probably uh, adhere to that at least. Um, but I am talking about going forward, when, uh, what time of day, uh, do we want to have them all in the morning, all in the evening? some in the morning, some in the evening. That's what I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to be sensitive to the issue that we're an elected body and uh, we need to be sensitive to uh, the, the residents and their, their perceived or uh, interests in participating. Yeah. I... Oh, no. Uh... Steve, I, I, just to the end of the year, and <clears throat> just a proposal for discussion. Um, I would say let's keep our morning monthly routine, but layer over that. We got a lot of we got a lot of stuff that's going to go needs to go public. Uh, like if we're going to talk about rates, probably one or two public forums on rates, and those can be meetings. Uh, I think we're doing the power supply policy again, and that gets into the environmental angle. So probably one or two meetings on that so i i think we're going to need some afternoon meetings hitting issues that people are really are going to want to probably more publicly participate in more than some of the stuff we deal with currently so i say you mean this proposal let's just keep the morning going and then later in you know i could see five or six evening special sessions that go into special topics in detail where we get a lot more public comment Yeah, just to build on what Dave said, I the five to seven slot is more of a challenge for me uh, personally than the early morning slot. Um, but I was thinking in terms of, and I don't know if there's a precedent for this, but having uh, an evening meeting that's just intended for public comment um, where we wouldn't necessarily need a quorum, but we could use it as a fact finding or information gathering and to you know, collect information from the public. And that way we wouldn't necessarily need a quorum, but we could um, still make sure that we're being transparent and, and try to share information with the public. I think Dave's point about one-off topic-based meetings is also helpful and, and might achieve the same goal. Uh, Steve, I, I just want to take a second to suggest that A, it's a very busy meeting calendar. And uh, 7.30 may be the first. It's not the only meetings that have ever happened at 7.30. And there are plenty of meetings that start at 8. Uh, so having a meeting in the morning is certainly not unusual. Um, the evenings are crowded with select board, school committee, um, planning board, and other meetings that often uh, get a pretty big audience, and that's competition. But I would also urge you, and I'll just say this, to be mindful of Belmont Light. There are six staff people from Belmont Light on this call. 
And I think we have to be mindful of their time. They have a long day and to keep them, especially in the evening, I think is asking a lot. Yeah, no, I know. And that's one reason why certainly we certainly wouldn't want to do it. Um, you know, the typical 730 start. Um, uh, but you're, you're right. And that's why um, I think it was when I started as chair all these years ago, I went to, I don't know if it was Craig or can't remember, remember and Craig and I said, what's, what's a good time for you? And that's when we started the uh, 730 slots. So we can keep uh, proceeding on that. I should also mention, I did uh, check in with Mark Palillo as chair of the select board. And he indicated an interest in having quarterly joint meetings with us. So um, we didn't talk about timing on those, but I presume those would be probably before the uh, typical Monday uh, select board meetings. Um, I don't know if he really meant quarterly, um, but that's that's what he indicated to me. So. Um, there will be, and I think I think it's important to keep the the. I mean, Roy, your liaison, which is great, but also to keep the um, all, the entire select board apprised of of what's going on, um, because uh, you know you're the you know overall governing body in town. So um, we will be having some joint meetings. Uh, with, with the light board as well. Okay, so um, I guess we'll continue with the the, the, the seven the seven thirty schedule. Now, the, the question I have now, though, and I guess this goes to Craig partly and to others. Um, Craig, when if if Mayhew is coming back with some detailed recommendations about great design and so forth and we're going to be talking about customer charges i mean i i think that is a two-hour discussion or close to it or maybe more um is that what 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 and then we talked about doing the financials uh, uh, next time as well so how we how do you see this playing out do we need to schedule an additional meeting yeah, I, I think that's probably the best course of action. Um, we do have a significant amount of, of uh, topics to get through over the next couple of months. And um, as for what everyone said, um, you know, I think Dave touched on it, where this is uh, the rate design uh, more broadly, you know, interested in uh, for the general public, that might be one that we want to do, whether it be in the evening or at certainly its own meeting to to give it the time that's required um, to do so. So, um, you know, I will say a couple of things just not to belabor the point, but uh, from a light department standpoint, Roy touched on it, having the right personnel on the call to answer the questions. Um, it's good to uh, be more in our, our work hours there, but uh, I just wanted to pass along. There's many um, utilities, uh, MLPs that, have their meetings during the day. So it's not an, an uncommon situation to have uh, meetings during the day. Uh, typically, I think the interest in the MLP is a little less intensive than in general government in the town. So it, it usually isn't an issue. Um, but when it comes to rates, I, I think it is appropriate to have that, um, whether it be evening or its own meeting, but it's spotlighted uh, a little differently than, than the average meeting. So. I would say we should probably think about having a separate meeting. Okay, yeah. I mean, one of the issues now, unfortunately, are the rates uh, probably need to be increased, which is something that none of us really want to do, but um, may get more attention from the public. I'm not sure. Okay, so do we want to schedule? So what would your proposal be, Craig? Do we, do we want to schedule another meeting in June? Um, um, I, I can talk with, um, so Mayhew will drive the schedule as far as when his uh, work is completed on the five-year plan and, and the rate, you know, when he has all that piece done. Um, we have our next meeting is June 22nd in the morning. We, we could either do right um, the week after that or 
I'm not available the week before. So if you want to do the week after that for a rate discussion in particular, uh, do we want if we want to do the evening, I don't know if that I think you mentioned five to seven. I know that might be tough tough for some people, but um you know, our not unlike the town, Belmont Lights uh, hours, we have a late night on Mondays. We stay uh, a little bit later. So Monday works well for the staff here at Belmont Light if we're going to have a, an evening meeting. But um, we can accommodate, you know, any day. But uh, that that's also a very heavy vacation week. So earlier is better in the week, I think, for us. But um, I'm thinking Monday, uh, June 27th. Is what I'm what I'm getting at, I guess. Okay, and you you you're thinking that that would be when Mayhew would be presenting. Yes. Yeah. I'll just I'll add that that uh, I'm going to be out of town that week, out of country that week, um, and I I suspect other folks as well might have some travel plans because the schools get out um, week prior, so. Uh, I don't know if other folks have commitments. Mm. Okay. Do we want to do two in the same week of uh, the week of the 20th? Yeah. Is the 20th better, Andy? Uh, yes. For me personally, yes. That's our, we cannot, we cannot do the 20th. Yeah, the 20th June. is a holiday. Yep, the June, 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 holiday. 18th, June 18th. Yeah. Thank you, Travis. Yes. <laughs> uh, you voted last time. Uh, yeah, this is difficult. Yeah, then the following Monday is July 4th, right? So <laughs> we start getting into the yeah. holiday and summer seasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it looks like a different day. Um, I guess whatever works for the board, uh, we can accommodate. And you said, well, when are the fin when are the financials going to be ready? Like, could we uh, move? Could we do two weeks ahead, like the eighth of June? We we could. So the financials are um, we, we'll prepare. We're preparing the first quarter financials as we speak, and the year end for two thousand twenty one. The audit they're, they're already prepared. So yeah. Um, so why don't we proposal? Why don't we handle the money financials dpu related work on june 8th and then mayhew on june 22nd yeah i uh, unfortunately i'm out of town on the 8th um, is there is that week work for you i could do monday evening i could do monday the uh, town meeting is on the uh, 6th yeah that's not gonna work and i'm tied up on the 7th uh, and Craig, you said you're gone oh, at the 13th, right? Oh, oh, hold yeah. on a second. Hold on just one. Hold on just one second. Are we allowed by open meeting law to do something like use a um, calendar? invite you know the um, doodle poll or something like that, that that might be a lot more effective efficient way for all of us to collectively indicate our availabilities yes yeah uh it's not, yeah it's not deliberation. i i uh, uh, apologize travis i am available on the 8th but that's also a potential town meeting day not in the morning <laughs> Not in the morning. No, no, I thought <laughs> you're right. I thought we were talking about the evening, but maybe we should uh, schedule it for the morning of the 8th. Is that yeah, okay? Sorry, that, that, that was my proposal. Sorry, I didn't think about you being in this, in this case. But yeah, I was proposing Wednesday morning of the June 8th to handle the DPW finances. And just to confirm, this is a remote Zoom based meeting. Yeah, we're still in remote through June, I as I understand it. Um, and then the question is, will it be extended into July and further? I don't know if Roy has any further on that, anything further on that. Yeah, I, I think the governor's order is July 15, but uh, still an open question what happens after that, uh, because we 
when the government when the governor's order expires, I think we have to go back to live until some technological provisions are made otherwise. Plus yeah, the board right. has to authorize select board would have to authorize remote participation. Uh, is there some proposal for hybrid participation though, Roy? Uh, so working on that, um, which would mean uh, I think at a minimum it would be physical participation by the members of the committee. And then the question is how to allow the, the public to participate remotely that uh, I think uh, IT is working on that, but I don't have any specifics right now. All right. Okay, so um, I guess the consensus seems to be a morning meeting on June 8th, 7.30 a.m. again, and we'll do the financials and um, perhaps some other items. I don't know. If, yep. um, certainly, I'd like to hear about the meme uh, conference. I know Dave uh, was there and Craig was there. Might be uh, interested in hearing about that. Uh, okay, so 7.30 June 8th. And then we'll have a, also a further meeting on the uh, 22nd. All right. There's nothing else on that. Uh, I believe we're ready to go into executive session finally. Nothing more. Uh, I will move that we go into exec executive session, to discuss trade secrets or confidential, competitively sensitive or other proprietary information. Is there a second? A second. And I think we need to state that we're not coming back to a session. Just we'll be adjourning both meetings. So we're ending the Zoom meeting, is that right? Ending this Zoom meeting, going to executive session and not returning to open session. Right. Uh, Roy, are you participating? No, I, I'm not going to participate in fact, but I wanna say that this whole meeting, I think uh, vindicates and validates the, des the decision to have a separate light board in the first place. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thank, oh, you, thank you. Thank you for saying that, Roy. Okay, uh, we need a roll call uh, vote. I believe um, uh, Dave. Yes. 